your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. You never change. You never fail, O oh God. True are your promises. True are your promises. You never change, you never fail, oh God. We raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Wide is your love and grace. You never change. You never fail, oh God. Wide is your love. Wide is your love and grace. Wide is your love and grace. You never change. You never fail, oh God. Who walks on the waters, who speaks to 
the sea who stands in the fire beside me he roars like a lion he bled as the lamb he carries my healing in his hands Jesus there is a name all in times of trouble, there is a song that comforts in the night. There is a voice that comes the storm that rages. He is Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the water, who speaks. To the sea, who stands in the fire beside me? He roars like a lion. He bled as the lamb. He carries my healing in His hands. Jesus. Messiah, my Savior, there is power in your name. You're my rock and my redeemer, there is power. Stand in the fire beside me. You roar like a lion. You bled as a lamb. You carry my healing in your hand. God, you walk on the water. You speak to the sea. You stand in the fire beside you roar like the lion you bled as the lamb you carry my healing in your hands Jesus there is no one like
take up my cross. Jesus, you are my God, whatever the cost. to surrender that we hold on to, Lord. Oh, Lord, let us see the futility in that and know that true freedom and liberty comes as we surrender it all to you, trusting, Lord, that you know the best ways, Lord. Our ways are not your ways, Lord, and we just thank you. Lord, receive our worship, receive our praise, Lord God. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you're doing, Lord, and we just thank you. And it's in the name of Jesus that all God's people say, Amen. Amen. This time, I'd like to dismiss the youth, the youth fellowship, and then the rest of us go ahead and stand. We'll sing one more.
the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my son. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my son. You are good. song of our heart you give us great reason to sing even if we do not consider ourselves singers we certainly consider ourselves worshipers and you place that song in our heart that makes us want to just sing out to you because you are good so good so faithful so true so gracious so kind so merciful and Lord, we just want to worship you today. We want to thank you and give you praise for all that you are doing in our lives today. And Lord, in the lives of those who are around us, Lord, we see so much going on with so many of our friends. And hopefully, Lord, it drives us to compassion, to prayer, to, to reaching out to them with that heart, your heart, Lord. And Father, we just want to once again lift them before your throne of grace, all those that we know that are suffering at this time. Lord, bless them, encourage them, and build them up, Lord, in the faith. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for this time that we have to worship you. Bless your word, Lord, as we approach it now. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody sound? Amen. Remain standing if you would. And if you can reach your Bible, turn there to Matthew chapter 22. Um, you know... I didn't expect Stella to read the remaining part of the chapter. Uh, she did a great job with reading verse 15, didn't she? 
Yeah, I'm just so proud of her. She did such a great, great job. But we're going to start there. We're going to read through the end of the chapter. It says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they went to him, uh, sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. The same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he married, had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, a second also, and a third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead... Have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare ask, uh, question him any more. Lord, we thank you for your word. Bless the teaching of it now, Lord. Help me to get out of your way. Let your Holy Spirit do his job. And I pray that you might use me today as your instrument. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be seated, please? So we come to our first scripture here in verse 15. It says, then the Pharisees. So it's telling us there's, there's something that happened before this. In the last few weeks, we've been going through the various parables that Jesus has been teaching the Pharisees and the Sadducees, explaining to them how they've missed the boat, how, how God had called them, called them as his people to let other people know about who he is. And instead, what they've done, they've internalized the whole thing. They've taken it unto themselves. They've kept people from coming. They prevented people from being able to worship God. They established a system of rules and regulations that made it very prohibitive to be able to come and to worship God in spirit and truth. And the last parable that we looked at was the one where Jesus explained that there was a marriage that was taking place and that the guests were invited to come, those that would be invited, expected to be invited, but none of them would respond and to come. And so then Jesus says, you go out in the highways and the byways and invite all, tell them to come. And so they did, and of course, the people came. But Jesus concluded that parable speaking of one individual who entered into the wedding who didn't have the proper garment on. And you remember, we talked about that. 
that garment. The garment is the righteousness of Christ. That's what enables us to be a part of the wedding ceremony between the bride and Christ. We are his bride as the church. But the only way that we can enter in is through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And so Jesus made it very clear to them that they were the ones that were supposed to be the, the ones that were invited. They were the ones that had the message. They had the word of God. They were the ones that were supposed to bring glory to God and to develop fruit for the ministry of God. You remember he had spoken to them about they were the, vine, the vineyard keepers, the husband of the vineyard. And how God expected them to tend that vineyard and to produce fruit fruit that he would reap that he would take in for himself and so he had explained it all to them and of course they all repented and said oh my gosh we've missed out we've all been wrong we've done the wrong things right no wrong we see even here in this section of scripture we find that they determine that what they're going to do is they're going to try to kill him. You remember when he talked about the, vine, the, the vineyard owner and how he sent his own son? They had already killed all the other representatives that he had sent. And now when he sends his own son, thinking that they're going to respond to him, instead they kill him. And so we see that this is the heart of the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the remainder of this chapter. That even though Jesus had made it very clear, he had explained it to them, what they were supposed to be about, what they were supposed to do, and all the things that went along with that, that still didn't turn their heart. They're still in that place where they determined that Jesus must die. And so we see that here when it says, then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. You see, they're, they're trying at this point to try to find a just reason in order to criminalize him to try him to put him to death that's what they're looking to do you know they don't want to just go out and murder him you know they want just cause and what they are doing and so they're trying to find out how they can do that and the interesting thing is here that there are two people that are spoken in verse 16 it says and are two groups i'm sorry and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. So you have two enemies that are here, the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Pharisees, they were the legalists, man. I mean, they were the guys that live by the rule of the law. And as a matter of fact, there, you hear often it is scribes and Pharisees. Because the Pharisees were the lawyers. They were, and we'll speak about that when we get down here a little bit uh, later. But they were the guys that, that studied the law, that knew the law. The scribes were the ones that wrote it down. And they were studiers of it as well. So, you, you know, those were a combined group, if you will. And they did not like the Herodians. Because the Herodians as in their name signifies, they were ones that followed Herod, uh, Herod the Great, which he had linked himself up with Rome, and there was a lot of compromise that took place, and the Herodians, they believed that, you know, we just want to live in peace, you know, we'll go ahead and do whatever they ask us to do, and, you know, it'll be good, you know, and everything else. And so there was this huge division between the two. They hated each other. But yet, because they both had this in common, they wanted to see Jesus die, they were willing to unite together in spite of the fact that they hated each other. Boy, I'll tell you, we see that kind of thing. It happens even within our world today. You see people that want to join together against the cause of Christ that you know, have very little in common and many times are at two opposite ends of the spectrum, but yet they, want to, they definitely are anti-Christ, anti-God, anti-Bible, and they just don't want to see any of that within our culture and our society. It is amazing to watch people today and how every other religion is acceptable. It doesn't matter what it is. As a matter of fact, you know, they're hoping that the Christians will just go away so that all the other, other, other religions can coexist because they're more than willing and happy to be together. It, it's funny, they say that now, but, you know, if that truly did happen, there, there's always going to be one that's going to try to become the one. You know what I mean? Because that's our nature. That's the nature of man. 
And even though they, they have these big ecumenical groups, you know, and they try to say that they can work all this out and everything else, and, you know, you're still going to have factions of people that, that won't abide by that. But yet, for the cause against Christ, it is not uncommon at all to see people unite together because there's such a hatred even still to this day for Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. They, they, already, they know he's dead, but what they want to make sure is that he doesn't resurrect as if they could stop that, and they cannot. You see, they come to him, and they begin to flatter him they say, teacher, you know that you are true. We know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone for you do not regard the person of men. You see, they hoped that Jesus was insecure or foolish enough to be impressed by their hollow praise. You know, and that's, <laughs> we're all vulnerable to that, aren't we? We all like the slap on the back. And as a matter of fact, I, I try to uh, avoid that as much as possible because I know I like the slap on the back, you know? Puffs my head, and I don't like that, and I know how I am. You know, I try to keep myself in the proper perspective. You guys hear me say it often, and it's because I, I need to hear it, and that is, you know, that God, you know, still speaking through donkeys today just like he did to Balaam. He does it every Sunday morning to you. You know, and there's a reason for that because it keeps me, it keeps me in the proper perspective that I'm, I'm nothing more than just an instrument of God. It doesn't make the instrument special because God can use anything. You remember as we had talked back a, a while back about when Jesus was coming in to the city of Jerusalem and the, and the people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees told him, hey, you tell your disciples to quit saying that. And Jesus made it very clear. If they don't, the very rocks will cry out. I'm as dumb as a rock. And I, I show that. And so I'm crying out because that's what God wants. But these guys were hoping that by saying all these flattering words about him, that, they would, that he would succumb to that. But this is what the Bible has to say about flattery. Psalm 5, 5, verse 9, it says, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongues. So that's what the Bible has to say about those that do flatter. And in this case, we're talking specifically about the Pharisees and the Herodians as they come before Jesus. But that is a truth that applies to all. Psalm 62, 4. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. That's these guys doing that very thing. Jeremiah 9, 8. Their tongue is an arrow shot out. It speaks deceit. One speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he lies in wait. Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. That is what flattery is. Jude says in, chapter, in uh, verses 16 through 19, it says, These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These, these are sensual persons who cause division, not having the Spirit. That's what it talks about, those who are the ones that flatter. Last one, because this is what's important to know, that flattery is not good, but truth is. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. If somebody loves you, they're going to tell you the truth about yourself. That's what they see. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to be critical all the time. But the last thing you want to do is lie to someone and tell them something that is not true because you want to flatter them because you don't want to hurt their feelings. As a matter of fact, on one commentary I was reading, I thought it was really great. 
Actually, it was a, uh, a dictionary of, of terms in the Bible under flattery. And it says that it was really, it, it did an injustice to those who would tell the young man who just preached a message how good he did when he indeed had not, and to deceive him into thinking that he should pursue the call that he doesn't have. I thought that was pretty good. I, I read over that one very quickly, but... You know, sometimes things go in and, and you can't get rid of them. Well, that's one of them. It's like, oh, no, how many people have told me, you know, that, yeah. <laughs> gee, when it's Christmas, is that why I'm doing this now? You know, all these people told me that and now I believed it and so I'm doing it. You poor guys, you got to put up with all that. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Those that will speak to you and tell you the truth because they want to minister to you. Not because they want to tear you down, but because they want you to be built up, and that's inevitably what it is. And flattery, it doesn't really build you up, but only for a moment, and, and it's deceitful. It does definitely do that. Verse 17 in our text tells us, Therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So they come to him, they ask him this question, What do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus' dilemma with the quest, this question was simple. If he said that taxes should be paid, he could be accused of denying the sovereignty of God over Israel, making himself unpopular with the Jewish people. If he said that taxes should not be paid, he made himself an enemy of Rome. So Jesus is caught between that proverbial rock and a hard place. You know, if he answers one way, you know, this is what's going to happen. If he answers another way, this is what's going to happen. And so I am sure by this time they think, we got him. We got the question. They're, we're going to be able to get him on this one for sure. If we can't kill him, Rome will because we'll, you know, we'll do it. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? You know, Jesus saw right through their flattery. You know, you say all these great things about me. Oh, man, you know, you're, a, you're a, a, a man's man. You have no regard for others. You know, you don't, you don't fear anybody. You say it like it is. You just put it out there, and they, they think they're going to flatter him and somehow or another win his heart over to them. But he sees it very quickly, and he says that he perceived their wickedness, and he calls them hypocrites because he knows that the only reason they're asking this question is they're trying to paint him into that corner. Verse 19, show me the tax money. So they brought it to him, brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. He answered their question by demonstrating that, that government does have a rightful place in everyone's life, and that one can be in subjection to government and God at the same time. Jesus brings balance to it all. As a matter of fact, there are times, you know, I'd, we go through these cycles, sometimes within the church, sometimes without, sometimes outside of the church, how people determine it's illegal for the government to charge us taxes, so therefore I'm not going to pay taxes. And uh, that works out really well for them because then they get free room and board for a number of years. So if that's what they're looking for, that's what they're going to get. But un inevitably, they're going to pay their taxes. And while they're there at the Gray Bar Hotel experiencing, you know, cub, uh, club fed, uh, they end up, you know, selling all their stuff and getting the back taxes that they were due. You know, so it doesn't work out too good. And uh, Jesus makes it very clear that, that he has established governments. And in order for a government to sustain itself, it has to have money in order to, to operate. Now, I, I do believe there's a lot of overtaxation, and I believe that if they were good stewards of the taxes that they had, they wouldn't have to tax us so much. So don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not a fan of taxes at all. As a matter of fact, around April the 15th of every year, I have to deal with another issue, and that is my problem with anger. Because I pay my taxes, but they got to pry it out of my hands to get it from me. Jesus brings that balance. 
You know, the government has to be supported, and we need to support it, and we need to support it in more than just paying our taxes. As a matter of fact, we are encouraged to submit ourselves to the authority of the government and to pray for those who are in authority over us. So it goes much further for the Christian than it does for the non-Christian. Because we know the Word of God, we know what God thinks about government and what we are to do. God makes it very clear that He appoints governments for the purpose of wielding, wielding the sword for justice, for punishment, for the different things that go on within the society. And so we as Christians need to be those who would fully support our government. Now, we are blessed to live in such a country that we have opportunity to have some kind of a say-so in what's going on. And so we do ourselves a disservice if we do not study about candidates and about different bills and things like that and then vote according to our conscience and the Word of God. And I think that that's the biggest problem with what happens today in our political system is that people are uninformed and that they watch too much TV and they see all the convincing commercials and they do something like vote for something. It's like, oh yeah, I don't have enough taxes. Would you please tax me some more? I like spending $4 a gallon for gas. I like, you know having less money every year because I have to pay more registration on my vehicles. I love it. Please, would you give me some more of that? And it's because people did not study and understand what that bill was all about. I'm convinced of that because nobody in their right mind would say that. Nobody would say that. And especially if you look at it and you see that there is a misappropriation of what they already take in. And if they'd simply spend what they have where they're supposed to spend it, then they wouldn't need to raise your taxes and mine. Okay, enough of my politicism. <laughs> and I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. That message applies to us all, okay? Jesus also reminded them that a sphere of authority belongs to God. When he says, give to God, that which is God's, that which belongs to Him. Individuals are to be subject also to His authority. As a matter of fact, primarily we are subject to His authority. If the government comes along and they begin to tell us to do things that are, that are in contradiction to God's Word, then we have a biblical mandate to follow God rather than men. You remember when the fellows were in the temple? You know, after the ascension of Jesus Christ and Peter and John, they're, they're there in the temple courtyard and they're preaching the gospel, you know, and they get arrested. They forbid them from preaching the gospel. And Peter says, hey, whether we obey men or God, you know, this is what you need to know. We're going to obey him. That was a paraphrase, by the way. Don't quote me on that word for word, but it is true. Obey God rather than man. When any time men tell us to do something that is contrary to what God teaches us in His Word, then we have a biblical mandate to stand up for that which is, is God's and not the world's. Man has both a political and, a, and spiritual responsibilities, and that's what I gleaned from what Jesus says there, that we have that. Verse 22, When they had heard these words, they marveled and they left and they went their way. Like I said, they thought they had him in a corner and that he could not get out of it. But you know what? It is pretty much impossible to outsmart God. Pretty much impossible. You can try, but you won't. The same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. So, of course, you guys all know my bad joke, but nonetheless, the same day, the Sadducees, and those are, those are the guys that didn't believe in the resurrection. I'm convinced that's why they were called Sadducees. Okay? Just a quick little side note, because I know so many of you were praying for me last week when I was in Minnesota, uh, and um, doing a, a memorial service there for one of my relatives. The Lord answered your prayers tremendously. We had four people 
uh, in the service that gave their heart and their life to Christ. <laughs> Plus, last night I, I got a, uh, a, a messenger message from uh, my relative that he received from somebody who attended the service and they went through and they just lined out the whole service and how it impacted their heart. To, they said that they'd accepted Christ when they were about seven or eight years old and been out there in the world just living their life. But after going to that memorial that they decided they're going to give their life over to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amen. All glory to God. You know? And, and the thing of it is, is you, you know what my message was? John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? That's what my message was. Because if there is no resurrection, then we are mo uh, among most men pitied because we subject ourselves to don't do this and do that and these kind of things. Because we believe in the resurrection. We believe that Christ has risen from the dead. So therefore, I subject my life to what God says in his word. But if he didn't rise, then there's no need for it. Eat, drink, and be merry. Have a good life as best you can. This one, because that's all there is. And that's what they believed. They believed that there was no afterlife, no resurrection. So they think that they are going to get one on Jesus. And they ask him this question about the man who had his brother's wife. wife. You see in Deuteronomy chapter 25, you find that this is where God lays it out for the, the nation of Israel. For his time's sake, I'm not going to read through the whole passage. It's, it's chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. And, but God lays it out for him. He says, look, this is what happens. If a man marries a woman and he dies, then his brother is obligated to take this woman as a wife and to have offspring with her. And the firstborn son from her is to be named after his brother. And this way, the lineage carries on. You know, it, to me, it, it's a beautiful picture of how adoption works, isn't it? When, when you take a child and you adopt that child, they're not, they're not just an adopted child. At least they should not be. They now become your child, your offspring. It may not be biological, but... You know, certainly it is because you've determined in your heart that you're going to pour out the love and the nurturing and the care that you would for a biological child. And you're going to make that, that child your own. God says that this is what's to happen. And this was to ensure the heritage would continue on. And so they had that obligation. And then God goes on to tell them, and if he doesn't do that, if he says, nope, I don't want to do that. Can you imagine this? Right? Here I am. My, my uh, brother's brother dies and he's got a wife and I never liked her in the first place. <laughs> Couldn't figure out why he married her. Really, dude? You picked that one? And now I got to pick her? <laughs> and then what happens? I say, forget it. I'm not going to do it. And so, therefore, I'm brought before the elders at the g city gate and she takes off her shoe and throws it at me. And then from that point on, I'm to be known as the man who had the shoe thrown at him. It was a big disgrace. <laughs> you know, it was no small thing, you know, for them in their day. So you had a choice, <laughs> but you better make the right one or you're going to regret it, you know, that kind of thing. But God did that, you know, for a purpose. And so, and, you know, once again, they thought that they had him, you know, it's because how foolish is it? You know, all the way through seven women, you know, seven men, you know. Now, verse 25, now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second, also the third, even to the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they, are, they all had her. So they're, they're putting forth this scenario that is just almost over the top unlikely ever to happen. But yet, you know, they're drawing that to say, okay, find your way out of this one. Just like the Pharisees had done, they thought that they had him in a place where he would not be able to answer. But he does. Verse 29, 
Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. God's Word taught the resurrection and His, and his power uh, to bring people back to life. That was already demonstrated. And so Jesus is telling them, You don't know the Scriptures. You don't understand that this is what God has been saying all along. Verse 30, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. Jesus then corrected the Sadducees' false notions. Heaven, he said, is not simply an extension of the pleasures, of the pleasures people enjoy on earth. Now, I find that people have trouble with this passage of Scripture because basically it's saying that they're not, uh, we're not going to be married to our spouse when we get to heaven. And most of the time it's ladies. You know, oh, I can't believe it. I'm not going to be married to my husband. Some guys feel that way. But it's mainly girls, you know, they, because they like it. They enjoy it. Men do too. I'm, I'm, I'm painting myself in a bad <laughs> corner right now, man. You know, when you dig in a hole, you find yourself digging a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. So, you know, the, the, point, is, the, the point is this, is that things are going to be different. And things are going to be different because there's no longer the need to procreate. And you see, that's, that's one of the main purposes of marriage. I know we have it in our culture and in our time that the main purpose for marriage is to be together because you love each other. That's the main purpose. It's not. It's not at all. It's actually to procreate and to have godly offspring. That's the main purpose for it. Now, the blessing of all that is that we do fall in love with one another, and it makes that whole process a lot easier and a lot better. Right? Would you agree? I think so. You know, but we have it all distorted, so the thought of it not being as it is here disturbs us. And the guys, they're thinking, what, you mean life without sex? What is that? You know, they're thinking, oh, no, that can't be. What kind of life is that going to be? You know? But just as it is with the angels, they, they don't procreate, and they have no desire to do so. When that day comes, when we have a new body without sin, and there's no longer any need to procreate, the desire for that will be gone as well. And believe me, you'll be content in it. You'll be happy that it is that way. Because then you will see that God's intention for life was so different and so much better than what we have here. So to, to, you know, pine for the things of this life in a place that will be devoid of all the sin that influences so much of this life is foolishness. We need to pine for the things of heaven, the things that God tells us in His Word, where there will be no more dying, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more sin. None of the things that grieve our hearts so much now, they won't be there. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to find that life extremely satisfying. Extremely satisfying. So, Jesus straightens them out. He says, guess what? The angels, they don't procreate, so neither are you. There's not going to be any need for that. But we will still know each other. We'll still all be together. We'll still have that love for one another. It'll just be different. That aspect of it will be gone. That's okay. Believe me. You know, the fact that I know that I will spend an eternity with my wife, but not just as my wife, but as my sister in Christ. That, that to me is beautiful. It's wonderful that I get to do that. You know, we're best friends now, and I anticipate that that won't change when I get there. It'll only be enhanced and be better. Verse 31, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, of the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. A more important issue is raised by the Sadducees, 
pertained to the resurrection if they had read and understood the Old Testament scriptures, they would have clearly seen there is a future life and that when a person dies, he continues to exist. To the Sadducees, the resurrection was ridiculous because they believe death ended with man's existence. You know, at that memorial, I even pointed out to those who didn't believe in the resurrection, what kind of hope do you have in life without the hope of the resurrection of, and of eternity? What kind of hope is there in this life? Is this all you get? Man, what a disappointment, you know? I, 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 just, I think to myself, I'm looking for, and no, go, don't get me wrong, I, I have a good life and I like life. It is good. But if this is all there is and I live and I'm, I'm born and I live and I die, what is that? But there's so much more that God has. More than we can hope and imagine. You know, it's hard for us to perceive and to understand. You know, I, I get started on those thoughts about heaven and about eternity. And, and I just get lost, man. I get stopped with eternity. Because I know the past. And I know the present. And I know I have a future, at least for the next moment or two. You know? There's not much more beyond that. But nonetheless, I have that hope of a future, right? But what I don't understand is time without end. I don't understand time without a beginning. That's what eternity is. No beginning and no end. Everything between is eternity. I don't understand that. I can't comprehend that. But I can't wait to experience it. Can't wait. No longer having to live by that clock. You know, having to finish up my messages on time. You know, all that kind of stuff. No clocks. Can't wait. But there's going to be such a long line of preachers who are there. I'll probably, you know, who knows when I'll ever get asked to get up there and share, right? Jesus quoted this statement that God had made directly to Moses at the burning bush. He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We find that in Exodus 3, 6. If the Sadducees were correct, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had died and were no longer present anywhere, the words I am should have been I was. The use of the present tense, I am implied that God is still the God of these patriarchs, for they are alive with God, excuse me, with God, and ultimately will share in the resurrection of the righteous. Verse 33, and when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teachings. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Now, this is, to me, this is incredible. All right, the Pharisees have already been shot down once. And uh, the Pharisees thought themselves to be better than the Sadducees. See, because they were the law keepers. They were the ones, not only were they the law keepers, they were the ones that held the keys to the gate. You know, they were better than the Sadducees. In their opinion, they really did view themselves in that way, that they were the true champions of the Word of God. They'd been shot down, but then the Sadducees are shot down, and they think to themselves, okay, we're going to give another stab at it here. So, then one of them, a lawyer, so now we know there's always a problem. Anytime there's a lawyer involved, there is a problem. Okay? No jokes about lawyers today. I'm out of time, so I, I'll spare you on that. The word lawyer here is, don't, don't associate it with what we have today, but understand that these people who studied the law, who wrote the, down the law, who did all these different things pertaining to the law, they were referred to as lawyers. So this is a Pharisee, a Sadducee, uh, or I'm sorry, a scribe. And that's why it makes that distinction here. He asked him, questioning and testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. At this time in history, with the Jews, this question was being debated among the religious leaders, and, and various commandments were being championed as the greatest. You see, they had noted that were, there were 613 laws that they had to obey. So as you can imagine, that's pretty overwhelming to try to ha- find yourself, you know, walking in obedience to all of those laws. And so they tried to determine which were the greatest and which ones were the least. And if they were the least, then you really didn't have to worry about them. But if it was the great ones, then you really had to pay attention kind of thing. So this was an actual debate that was taking place at Je- in Jesus' day. And Jesus' quick reply summarized the entirety of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. The first summarizes the first part of that, the first table of the law, which deals with relationship between us and God. You shall have no other gods before you. You know, you shall worship Him and Him alone. You shall obey the Sabbath, which was set apart, and to worship unto Him. And then the rest, the next they summarize the second. You know, the first is you shall have, you know, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. When you have those two commandments, if you're walking in those two commandments, you find that the rest of the commandments are just naturally a part of your life. Because when you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal from him. You're not going to bear false witness. You're not going to lie, you know, because it it does harm to you and to those who are around you. I mean, you know, it's just natural that if you truly do love your neighbor as yourself, and if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I don't really love myself, you're absolutely wrong. You love yourself too much, I can guarantee you, because it's a problem that all of us have, and that is that we think way too much of ourselves and the importance of our life in regards to others. There's a false teaching that says that you've got to love yourself before you can love others. Well, okay, you don't have a problem then. You should be able to love others because you love yourself quite well. The problem is, is we don't love ourselves to deny ourselves for the sake of others. And that's what God calls us to do. And if you're doing that, then you don't have to worry about those commandments because you're not going to steal, you're not going to lie, you're not going to commit adultery, you're not going to do those other things if you're loving your neighbor as yourself. And you're not going to walk in disobedience to God and His Word if you're loving Him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. One of the other Gospels adds in there, and your strength. We can summarize that saying, giving of yourself 100% to the Lord. If you're doing that, then guess what? You don't have to worry about the sh- thou shalt nots and the thou shalt do's because you'll be walking in that and wanting to do those things. I don't do a lot of the things I did before I became a Christian, not because I can't, but simply because I love God so much that I don't want to. And he's shown me in his word how those things are not profitable for me and the damage and the destruction that it brought about in my life. So I simply say, Lord, I want to do your will in my life because I love you, because I'm concerned about being one of those that loves the Lord God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my mind, with everything that is within me. And Lord, I want to love my neighbor as myself. I struggle with that more than I do with loving God. But I guess if I struggle in loving others like I do myself, then I can't say that I'm loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, all my mind. So I'm working on that. I'm sure we all are. We have those issues in our life that demonstrate that we need to be more faithful in our obedience to Christ. Jesus summarized it all up for us so that we know that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The Old Testament develops and amplifies these two points. Love for God and love for others who are made in God's image. Mark reported that the teacher of the law here said uh, Jesus had correctly answered the question 
And that love for God and one's neighbor is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. The light was beginning to shine into this man's heart, and he was not far from the kingdom, as Jesus says. It is kind of that same way today for us. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If we say that we know God and we don't keep his commandments, then the truth of God is not in us. So which of the commandments must we obey? Well, I think I've made it very plain. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and love others as yourself. And upon that, you'll find yourself in obedience to all the things that God puts in his word for us to walk in. Verse 41 While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. They they knew quite well, very quickly, what the answer to that was. And he said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstools. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Like I said, their answer came quickly, for they knew the Messiah was to come from the line of David. And Jesus' reply demonstrated that the Messiah had to be more than simply a human son of David. As many in that time were thinking, just as they think today, they're expecting a man to come, a a human being, not the anthropos, the God-man. They're not looking for the re turn of Christ. They are looking for their Jewish Messiah, and there's one that will come, and he's going to present himself as a man, and they're going to begin to follow him, and he's going to bring peace, peace in the world, and peace in Israel, only to have that peace broken after three and a half years, and the wrath of God will be poured out upon the face of the world, the face of the earth. That time is coming. They're still looking for that man. If the Messiah were simply an earthly son of David, then why did David ascribe deity to him? Because that's what he is doing here. Jesus quoted from Messianic Psalm, Psalm 110, verse 1, in which David referred to the Messiah as my Lord. And the Lord translates the Hebrew word Adonai, used only of God, not Elohim, which can be in reference to other gods, they are called Elohim, but Adonai is significantly and singularly used to speak of Yahweh, Jehovah, the true and living God, used only of God. If David calls his son Lord, he certainly must be more than a human son. You see, this would have also been unusual because no man would call his biological son Lord, even Elohim. No matter how old the old man gets, he's still the patriarch of the family. He never loses that status, and he doesn't yield that status to his son. But yet, clearly, David is yielding himself to the Messiah. And so he points it out to them. So what is he saying here? He's making it very clear. This is a messianic statement. This is Jesus saying, I am God. I am he. I'm the one. You know, he'd been telling them their responsibility, their obligation, the things that God had called them to do. And they would refuse to see it. They'd refuse to acknowledge it. They'd refuse to obey it. And Jesus, one more time, is making it very clear. Look, guys, don't miss this. This is very important. I'm the one. I'm the one. Certainly, Jesus says that to us today. Don't miss this. This is very important. Jesus is God incarnate in the flesh. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the only way that we're going to enter into eternal life. Jesus and Jesus only can transform and change the life of a person. Jesus and Him only can enable you to be a part of the wedding that He's going to have with his bride. In verse 46, it says, And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. The reason was obvious. 
Jesus was answering them as no one had ever done. In Mark's gospel, in the very beginning of the gospel, it tells us about Jesus teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And one of the things it says about him, it says that they marveled because no one ever taught the word of God with this kind of authority. He taught because he wrote it. He never missed a point. He, there was never a misinterpretation of the word of God on Jesus' part, right? You never had to question what he had to say. Go ahead and question what I say. Look it up in the scriptures and test it. I, I definitely want you to do that. But with Jesus, you didn't have to worry about that. If he said it, that's that. It's true. And he astounded people with the authority by which he spoke. And the insight that he had, of course, he had the insight. And here he taught them about the resurrection. He taught them about heaven. He taught them about life, right? Government and worshiping God and all of those things. And he taught in such a way that it astounded them. Every question that they had, he had an answer. Every time they thought they could put him in a corner, they never could. As a matter of fact, we'll see in his trial when they're, they're trying him, they'll come out and ask him, are you the Messiah? And he'll say, it is as you have said. And they say, what more do we have need of for witnesses? He blasphemes himself. Well, he had already been doing it. He'd been telling them that he was the Messiah. This is a very clear statement that Jesus is God and that there is life after death. There are th some who think that somehow when they stand in front of God that they will be able to enter into the kingdom of God with their own garments on. Somehow or another, you're going to be able to explain away how you're there and you don't have the proper garment, but it won't work with God. You know, you can, you, can, you can speak to others as much as you want to and maybe convince others that you can get in in some other way other than through Jesus Christ, but it's not going to happen. He makes it very clear from the previous section that it is impossible to enter without that. His salvation is based on His work and His imputed righteousness to us. In Acts 4.12, it tells us, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. None other. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 6 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scripture, and that He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, He was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So the question this morning to us is, do we believe this? God knows you and loves you, but do you know him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and I thank you for, Lord, just ministering to our hearts and our lives. I pray that you would strengthen us in our walk with you, that you would help us, Lord, in our desire to follow after you. And I pray, God, that you would prepare our paths before us. And Lord, I pray this morning, if there's anyone that is here that does not know you, that, Lord, today would be the day that they choose to give their heart and life to you. And while we're praying, if there's anyone here this morning that has not ever received Christ as their Savior, and you would like to do that this morning, the Holy Spirit has pricked your heart, and you know that you need to be obedient and give yourself to him, would you please just raise your hand and allow me to pray with you to receive Christ as your Savior today? Anybody at all this morning? Anybody at all? All right. Thank you, Father. 
Bless our day today. And Lord, as we go, I pray that you will put people in our path this week that we would have that opportunity to share of the hope that is in our hearts, Lord, the hope of Jesus. And Lord, give us boldness in words that we might speak to others about these things. And Lord, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand?